Hi everyone, welcome to Wandering DMs. I'm Paul. And I'm Dan. On today's episode of Wandering DMs, we're going to be talking about Wandering Monsters, uh, which is the, the the where we get the title for the show, actually. So I'm surprised. I'm kind of surprised, Paul. It's taken us this long to get around to. Yeah, yeah. It's been on the list. Sake. Been on the list for a uh, long time, I think. Right. Yeah, I think you're right. Uh, uh, and so, uh, what should we talk about today? Uh, should you use Wandering Monsters? Uh, the answer to that is yes. Um, <laughs> how often should you roll for them, and um, how uh, how powerful should you make them? Is, uh, uh, all that and more today on Wandering the M's. <laughs> I was I was mentioning to Dan, uh, you know, back in the day, that the thing that spawned this very show was Dan and I going to conventions and having these crazy conversations. And I was like, this is this is totally one of those, right? This is right. one of those things where we probably are close, but kind of disagree a little bit, and we'll just you know <laughs> circle each other. And <laughs> I'm predicting this is going to be a good one. <laughs> so, a, a, a small bit of sparring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> a small yeah. bit of sparring. Yes, good for that. That's, uh, um, that's where, where we're likely to end so, up. Uh, so, I mean, so, yeah. so Paul and I are both, you know, classic D and D, you know, um, you know, players, and obviously, a Wandering Monsters was a you know mechanic that's core, really very central to um, to classic D and D, both original D and D and BX and stuff like that, and it's something that is uh, less used in. Um, you know, in in uh, later later editions, do they do, does does uh, let me ask Paul, Paul? Do you know, like in fifth edition, does there a core regular mechanic for wandering monsters in the dungeon, or is that not not, the, not that I'm aware of? Yeah. Um, not that I'm aware of. No, no. I think it would be per adventure uh, yeah. would indicate whether or not to roll for them. Now I'm now I'm trying to remember like how called out is that in the original text, or maybe in BX or something like that. Um, I feel like it is, but I feel like every module then would would warp the rules a little bit right they would always say check this frequently or roll these dice or you know right it was a very right. commonly i think house ruled thing in or not house ruled but very commonly manipulated thing in in old modules i feel yeah it's interesting because i feel like so original D D has a core you know rule for uh, uh wandering monsters in the wilderness and wandering monsters in the dungeon and i feel like and I, I i think i realized this kind of late in the game that the core wandering dungeon monsters is is really specific to the Greyhawk castle environment, hmm. right? So what you get there is really an expression specifically of what Gary did in his Greyhawk castle, Castle Greyhawk dungeon, wasn't specifically you know phrased that way. It wasn't it, did, it wasn't presented as here's what I do in Castle Greyhawk. It's just like here's how you do monsters in the dungeon and for whatever reason it hadn't occurred to him at that point that there would be different uh environments uh, uh in different dungeons and so obviously it's something that makes sense and you're right they're usually what there really ought to be tables tuned to the dungeon that you're in but that wasn't that actually wasn't explicated in the original rules i'll, I'll tell you what this is the, the most common way i use wandering monsters these days myself right. is actually part of my sort of standard dungeon authoring toolkit if i'm going to sit down and write a one-page dungeon let's say and i've got a map and i'm going to stock it uh usually what i do is i sit down and i make a list of all the monsters that might appear in the dungeon so i've got yeah. you know, usually i'm hoping for like 20 yes. right i want a list of 20 so i can right. roll it on a d20 okay. Okay. and then stocking the dungeon you know alternating between intentional choices and rolling on that table gotcha. and then when i'm done I look at what's left on the table, and what's left on the table goes into the Wandering Monster chart. Interesting. Are you talking multiple levels at once, or are you talking just one level at once? One level at once. And this is, I mean, okay. this is very much specifically like like if I was doing a, a single... You know what? Let me, let me go back. Um, when I author dungeons, I typically don't make multi-level dungeons. Uh, okay. The, yeah. You know, okay. big big mega dungeons are not really my forte on writing size. Uh, okay. Usually, if I'm okay. running a campaign, what I usually prefer is a large wilderness with many small dungeons scattered throughout. Yeah. Okay. Um, so so okay. multi level is pretty uncommon for my writing style. Not to say I wouldn't run them, but usually if right. I'm running a multi level dungeon, it's because I found another one somewhere printed that I like and I want to use it. Gotcha. Gotcha. It's interesting because my understanding is that it's sort of like the Arnesonian style. The Arnesonian style is to emphasize the wilderness in a bunch of different places, and maybe like Agaxian style was more the whole game's a dungeon. Yeah, and yeah. if you want anything else, go play outdoor survival. Hmm. Um, I mean, certainly, and I will say, like, 
uh, wilderness, I'm much more likely to use wandering monsters in wilderness than in yes. a dungeon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's like, well, now on that point, I must, and, and thanks to John Peterson, so I was flipping through playing at the world here, um, because of course the wandering monster mechanic itself originally comes from outdoor survival. Mm-hmm. So uh, the the that the uh, you know the can you can you trek through the wilderness board game um, uh, from uh, Avalon Hill right? Is it? Yeah, I Hill? believe it. Yeah, it's Avalon right. Hill. Okay, I'm just I'm looking at the uh, right. So by Avalon Hill, of course, um, that is required as we said multiple times is required uh, equipment when you're playing D and D and provides the background to our show. As a matter of fact, obviously yeah. it's the background of outdoor survival. Um, had uh, the the two well, I guess there's three main mechanics in outdoor survival, right? It's uh, are you getting enough food and water? Mm-hmm. Um, are you getting lost? There's a die roll every day to see if you're lost, and then there's an optional roll for encounters. Um, and so if I look at, so I'll take one of the I, I I'll take one of the mission cards from outdoor survival, and on the front, so here's the the food issues here. Here are, is the direction ability, and if you roll low, you get lost. Notice that. So notice that rolling low there is worse. And then there's a completely optional thing in the rules on the back side of the card. There's possible encounters. Mm-hmm. Now, you only go to this table if, you, A, you've decided to use the optional mechanic, and B, you roll high. So using this, there's an additional D6 roll each day. And if you roll a 5 or a 6, then you go to this table. And you notice that there's actually several different categories here. There's natural hazards, which is probably like weather type stuff. It's very abstract, right? The only effects here are, do you lose a turn? Do you lose some food, right? Do you maybe gain some food is kind of rare. So it's very, very abstract, but it seems like the main categories are like weathery type stuff and then, you know, animal type stuff. And then just you were personally being stupid type stuff of like either tripping, <laughs> either tripping or setting your camp up wrong or something like that. Interesting. So interesting. it's interesting that the the overall mechanics were entirely lifted from outdoor survival, right? Yeah. If you look in original D and D, the chance to be lost is rolling low, and the chance for a monster encounter is rolling high, and so they're they're totally you know they totally don't have a unified mechanic precisely because he entirely just lifted the mechanic right out of outdoor survival. It's just that um, the only encounters now are just monsters, right? So there's no, in original game, there's no weather, there's no accidents, there's no quicksand, Mm -hmm. there's just monsters. And so there are times when, like, I feel, you know, like that's a little bit too bad, actually, that I wish that the core D&D mechanic included those other environmental things like weather and accidents and stuff like that. But it's again, I feel like that's, that's a thing you're going to find in the modules themselves. I think like, I'm thinking of like, um, uh, you know, a lot of the X modules, I feel like certainly a lot of the X modules have sort of expanded encounter, random encounter tables that have all kinds of interesting weather stuff or whatnot. Good point. Right. Again, maybe this is a case of why would you need a weather chart if you're in the dungeon? Good point, but also wilderness, right? So, the, so actually, I'm thinking wilderness right. first, right? right? So the wilderness, right. you know, there's no lost table in dungeon, obviously. So um, uh, even the wilderness, just monsters, right? Just just right. lots and lots of monsters all over the world. Um, right. Right. Obviously, you're right. In the, if you're if you're so, focused on the dungeon, then even more reason to get rid of it, right? So um, you know, a little of this, you know, boils down to like how you're running your game and and whether it's very procedurally generated and you're improvising a lot or you're, you know, pre-thinking out a lot of your content. And I know my style and probably, you know, a lot of people's style is some mix of those, right? Like not not completely in one direction or the other, but some, you know, meld of the two uh, inputs there. Um, but I think that when we when we talk about wandering monsters and like why why are they there, when you start to think sort of critically about them, why are they there and do you want them? It comes down to pacing. In my mind. Yes. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. So Pretty so good. then again, and I feel like like a broken record on this one, but uh, it's so different for me when we're talking about one shots or convention games versus you know long running campaigns. I think I feel like my opinion is going to change radically based on which which of those two things we're talking about. And again, it took me a long time to realize the difference. Now I agree with that. And I, I, it, uh, as, as a, a, a t- tiny little bit of OCD, I read the text. The text says X. I do X. That's what it said. That's the text. <laughs> uh, that's the script. 
Um, and uh, having attempted to run a number of convention style games using the, the rules, including Wandering Monsters, and realizing the pacing was all off, I, it finally got through my very thick skull that, um, that, yeah, you have to distinguish between the two contexts. And nowadays, I just abort wandering monsters in a convention game. Is that basically what, what you're saying yep, you do? Yep, four hours is just such a tight, short experience that yep. um, you just need you need more control, I think, over pacing. So um, yep. probably not, you know, I might have the table there handy just in case, like right. if I'm in that extreme of pacing of it, they're going right. too quickly and I need to right. slow them down, right. but that's so unlikely. Much right. more often it's I need to cut, I need to cut because I want to get them through stuff faster so that right. they can have a... An experience that follows some kind of arc. Let me. Okay, so let me. So the, I'll touch back, and then we'll. But I, I have so many now. Okay, now I'm realizing yeah, we have so yeah. many things to say. Now I was yeah, worried. Yeah, no, I, was I, knew, worried I knew it was going this way. Go on. Okay. Right. So the um, so basically, you know, I basically designed my dungeon pretty similar to what you said before. I except I picked left fewer monsters. Actually, it's like my my current mm-hmm. habit is per level to pick like a half dozen, pick like six. How big's and a level? How many rooms? 40 rooms. Okay. 40. Okay. 40 rooms. It's pretty big. It's, it's, pretty big. it's 30, 30 by 40 squares, which gives me approximately about 40 rooms-ish. I will say this. Uh, when, I, when I have my list of 20 monsters, even uh, when, I, when I put some of them in the, in the level and then, yeah. and then use some of the leftovers to make with the Wandering Monster table, there's usually some extras that don't make the cut at all. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Interesting. So for me, I try to have it be the same. Like I try to, I try to place a layer for each of these half dozen monsters, and then that's also the wandering monster ch- chart. And I'll say this: I make the wandering monster chart first. I mean, we're sort of saying the same thing. Is I actually go, yeah. what are the half dozen monsters I want on this level? And that the wandering monster chart actually comes first for me, and then I go and I actually design the layers of where where their main stronghold is on the level. So here's here's an interesting thing. Uh, sometimes I, I struggle with how to interpret when I roll a wandering monster chart. Where did the monsters exactly come from, right? So you're saying you're right. tying them to specific layers, which is great. But yeah. the problem I have with that is there's some monsters where that makes perfect sense. Uh, you know, uh, uh, who knows how many giant centipedes are in the walls, right? Yeah. Whereas when it's like, say you're in a goblin den, and you're like, right. okay, there's a goblin king, and he's got his personal guard, and there's you know 50 goblins or whatever. Right. right. Does that mean that you're a little looser on how many total goblins are in the place, or when you roll in the wandering monster, are you deducting them from other locations? Great question. I don't. Right. I don't deduct them from other locations. Uh, um, you know, I assume that there's there's, there's wandering guard groups, yeah. or I'll have a um, you know I'll have a barracks that is a third full. Like I, here's a barracks and there's thirty beds. There's ten goblins in the room, and Without saying it, I just like where, what 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 are the other twenty beds being used for? Well, all yeah. the other goblins are wandering around in guard groups on a on a you know regular schedule. So uh, in my uh, vile crypt, the Reawakened Sisterhood, right. uh, in the fifth edition version of that, that's available on DM's Guild, uh, right. there are exactly six acolytes, and there is a yeah. wandering monster table, and one of the entries is an acolyte. And so I specifically yeah. say in there, it's either the one from this room or that room, and if those right. two are both dead. You're going to have to right. re-roll it to something else or nothing. Else. You know, the first time I saw, you know, uh, the first time I saw a mechanic like that was in, you know, one of your favorite modules, um, uh, 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 Secret of Bone Hill by Len Lakofka, right? Mm-hmm. Was mm-hmm. he has, like, up in front, he has this full roster of every monster in the dungeon. And anytime you run into somebody, you're supposed to mark it off the roster. Yeah. And I thought that was really novel. That was the first time I'd ever seen that. Um, do you do that for every single monster, or is it no. just like big, important name it, chiefs? Well, like that? for me, it's the ones that actually have a layer where I know exactly yeah, how okay. many things there are, right? Okay. So I certainly have some monsters in my Wandering Monster chart, like I said, where don't tie back to anything in the dungeon, and right. they're literally wandering, right? Like they have no right. home here, they just happen to right, right. come by. Right. Uh, but when I do tie it to a specific thing that is layered in the dungeon, then yes, right. absolutely, I expect to knock it off because really? I don't know. I find oh, it really wow. weird if, okay. like, if you went through and killed all the goblins in the goblin area, and then right. a little later we roll randomly and you find d6 goblins. What's going on? Where were those goblins before? Well, that's a different. That's <laughs> now that uh, that's that's a different direction of the implication arrow, Paul. I will point out, and I will say, and probably I shouldn't. I shouldn't admit this to my players. But my mechanic is once you wipe out the lair, then I strike that item off the wandering monsters table. 
go. There you go. And so that if my play, if my players are listening, they will they'll they'll recognize that there's been a number of times where I go a level that you've been on before. I roll a wandering monster check, which is visible actually, which they see. I go, let's go see what it is. I roll another die. I check the table. I go, oh, I guess nothing shows up this time. Now that's and that's interesting. The that's... They they wiped out the layer, and therefore I strike it off the chart. That's um. You know, I like the idea of rolling the Wandering Monster chart in front of players. I think that's yeah. interesting. I've never actually done that. Um, okay. So that begs the question, oh, we're all over the map now. <laughs> How often do you roll? How often do you check, Dan? I have really struggled with this. I think this is a real issue. And obviously, the original book says every 10 minutes uh, of, of game time. And I think I, I, I came to think that that was too frequent. Um, uh, and so now I do every fifth, what I personally do is I do every 15 minutes of real time yep. is I'm not, I'm not super, I'm not tracking like you did this and that took a round and then you search this room and that took two, two, two turns. I actually just have a watch on the table and every 15 minutes I, in real time, I make a, I make a D six roll. There was uh, a time a while back where I was running with an actual little, uh, flip turn counter. Right. This is when I was being very right. literal about running BX. Right. So every turn was 10 yeah. minutes. And right. it was like, remember when your spells are cast? Remember when you lit a torch? Because you right. know, this is the nut. When this number comes up, that's dead. And, and right. then I would do that for like wandering monster checks. I actually ran a game using that at Gen Con back in like 2008. Yeah. And I uh, have a, a friend that I met there at the table that you know I'm still in touch with who freaking loved that. He thought like, this is, this is great. This is the way it's meant to be run. Yeah. I've yep. long since stopped doing it. Which is kind of funny. <laughs> yeah. uh, but uh, here's here's my problem with that. Uh, again, I yeah. think Wandering Monsters, best thing about Wandering Monsters is their ability to control pacing. And yeah. I personally, especially when we're talking campaign play, I like to use Wandering Monsters to solve what I call the Goldilocks problem. Okay. So uh, some folks who've ever read my blog might might know this, but I'll just reiterate it real quick. So the Goldie blo the Goldilocks problem is this: uh, I like my dungeons to have some level of uh, realism or or some sense of it them being a location and not like a level in a in a video game, right? Yeah. I, I I really rebel strongly against the idea that a dungeon could be cleared, right? Yeah, okay, maybe you killed all the goblins in this den, but um, Let's see, to bring it to, to that analogy of, like, it's a location, right? It's like a neighborhood or it's like a house, right? right? If, if right. the cops uh, run into a house and find a bunch of folks uh, with a meth lab and they arrest them all and take them away, how long is that house going to remain empty? Not forever, right? Eventually, right. someone's going to buy it at auction or house flippers or get their hands right. on it or, or right. uh, you know, squatters show up. People are going to show up, right? That house right. is not going to remain empty. Right. right. So um, Goldilocks problem is this. We're in the dungeon... Uh, killed a bunch of monsters, still haven't seen everything. I, as DM, know exactly what's in the dungeon, and I know who's aware that the players are there and who isn't and what defenses they're taking. And then the right. players decide, well, we are low on spells, low on health. We're going to lock ourselves in this room and sleep. I hate that. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I hate right. that, and it's yet like, I know it's common, and it's right. even suggested at some point. It happens one of the all the original. time. Players yeah, I'm just like, that no, so that's so crazy, right? right? Like, it's right. Goldilocks. I'm going to break into your house, yeah. and then I'm going right. to lock myself in your room, and I'm going to take a nap. Right, right. Really? Right, right. Well, guess what? Right. I'm not going to... My monsters who are aware that you're here, they're not just going to wait for you to have your nap. They're going right. to come, right? So right. that's usually... Right. Uh, that's when I get like to get very literal... And I say, okay, well, every 10 minutes, every 10 minutes of game time, I'm supposed to make a wandering monster check. You're going to rest for right. eight hours. Okay, right. six times eight is 48. Let me make 48 checks right now. Right, right, right. What right. do you know? Something's showing up. Right, right. You know, there's a, now, there's a, there's a, there's a downside. I feel, this might have been many, many, many years ago, but I feel like I got in trouble trying to follow the, that policy. And the trouble, among the trouble is that, it's actually advantageous for the players to be on the defensive is they would prefer to have the monsters having to bust down a door, have a choke point, have a defensible point, and they would actually prefer to be on that side and, and take a defensive stance as monsters come in and they just chew them up. Well, um, don't uh, find monsters that don't have to use the door, I guess, is my response to that. I definitely yeah, remember having a moment when... Uh, a whole bunch of giant centipedes came crawling out of holes in the walls yeah. in the room that they were yeah. hiding in. I was like, well, you know, they're borrowers. Sorry, here they come. 
Two, I mean, that's the two, two approaches that I have is one to just announce that this will not be restful and your, your wizards cannot get their spells back in this situation. And then two, with my pretty darn close to original um, uh, healing rule, right, that you need to be in town in a restful place for a whole week before you get any hit points back, um, that, it, that pretty much clinches the, there's, there's, it's not a good idea to sleep in the dungeon yeah, I mean, that uh, solves it for health, but does it solve it for spells, right? Surely somebody's going, oh, I need my spells back. Yeah, and I just say you can't, you're not, it's not restful enough in a dungeon. That just enough. doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's reasonable. So, it's reasonable no hit points and no spells when you're in the dungeon. Um, yeah. Uh, and that usually clinches it for me. Yeah, I definitely, uh, you know, I, I, it became a little game for me, honestly, until, until my players right. realized what I was doing and, and stopped, you know. Stopped. Also, right. read my blog and like saw me rail against the golden blocks, <laughs> right. right. and then we're right. like, okay, well, let's maybe right. not do that anymore. Right. Um, you know, like a little game of like, okay, what wandering monster shows up? Okay, so it's you know, group of orcs, and the, the players are are in this room with the door locked. What are they going to do? I, they might try to bang down the door the first time. Maybe right. the second time. Now they're going to oh, maybe we should lay some traps. You know, and then I'll yeah. then I'll just screw with the players. Oh, you you hear something right. going on out there? <laughs> Hammering. You hear hammering. What? What's happening? There's some sort of motor noise in the background. <laughs> <laughs> You're not oh, sure. Players what can't take that. They're going to go investigate. Fine. Oh, it's like the a rest fine What's happening? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's great. It's a, I envision totally envision that scene from uh, Holy Grail, right, where the where the Frenchmen are up on the ramparts and you hear all the right, the right, woodworking right, right, noise. Right, they're like. Right. That's totally what I'm. <laughs> you're not fooling anyone, totally guys. Right now, myself. You're right. Yeah, yeah you're right. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. I mean, for so for me, you know, for me, the the, the I, I do try to have those things very mechanical and very objective in because I don't trust myself to be fair or unfair. So I do attempt. Right. It does, I do attempt to have these things on rails and on dice, and the dice are being shown to the players, and I tell them what the chances of an encounter showing up. Um, um, uh, but it, but but I I know that, m that many times, Paul, you take more of a free hand in manually adjusting for pacing purposes, right? Yeah, I mean, there's so many other factors that play into pacing, right? Factors that right. have nothing to do with the game, right? Like, right. How right. how many sessions are we going to get to play? Who's you know who's yeah. up visiting my house for once in a blue moon? Yeah. I want to make sure that person has a yeah. good time, right? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. It it gets tough, and then I just don't want the dice to to you know drag my game down. Yeah, uh, you know, yeah. For for I mean, for me, you know. <laughs> My game world is a terrible place. <laughs> it's been said many times that it's a terrible time to be alive in my game world. No, um, and, uh, you know, it's the, 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 the dice provide an opportunity for it to turn into a horror story at any moment. Um, and that's part of what you're dealing with is an uncaring, uh, um, <laughs> a Lovecraftian universe that is willing to not notice that it's chewing you up from time to time and you have to find a way to try to deal with that. I mean this is this is this is approaching our metagaming conversation, right? <laughs> where like like yeah. I am I love the idea of having something in the game where the players are doing something tedious and are bored, but the last thing in the world I want to do is to actually bore my players who are sitting around the table. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's. I mean, I yeah, want them to I mean, role play it, being bored. I don't want them right. to be actually bored. Right. No, I don't want them to be role playing being bored. But they, they, you might actually have to be role playing being horrified. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Sure. You might have to role play being terrified based on your 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 existence being being uh, predicated on completely random die rolls that's out of your control at this point. Yeah, uh, yeah. that that you might actually have to do at my table. So sorry, <laughs> so, sorry, but that's uh, that's part of what's going to happen there. Um, so, so the wander, I feel like the wandering monsters are, are for me an important part of that is the, the threat could be more than you assumed or it could be less than you assumed on a particular night. Again, I really like having them there and I like any adventure that tells me yeah. it's a wandering monster chart yeah. and I consider it, you know, my, my job as DM to know when to roll on it and when to ignore it. Okay. Okay. And, and that's going to change for me moment to moment. Okay. Okay. Yeah, for me, it's on a hard clock. <clears throat> yeah. For me, it's on a it's on a it's on a literal no, timer. 
Now, I like that as a as a yeah. tension building device, especially when you're talking yeah. about pl rolling the rolls out in the open. I think right. that's really nice as a tension builder. Um, I'm right. thinking now of like, um, uh, what's the Lamentations of the Flame Princess module? Um, uh, oh, geez, just ran it myself not too long ago. Anyway, uh, the point being, uh, it begins... Death Frost Doom? Or, Death Frost Doom, that's exactly the yeah. way you got it. Yep. So it begins with cracking open this the door to this tomb, and then I think there's like some stuff that's frozen up in the air and it starts to defrost and, and big blocks are dropping. And basically right. it tells you right in the beginning of the module, they're like, this is a tension building pacing mechanic, right? That this is gotcha. going to happen yeah. every 10 minutes of real time. So every 10 okay. minutes, you know, you have to have a timer in front of you. Right. And every 10 minutes of real time that pass, describe a loud crash and the, you know, things right. dropping and falling because right. if this, you know, the whole place is about to defrost and collapse. Right. Um, I, 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 I agree. Brilliant. And, um, brilliant. It, it, yeah, it I mean, lands it, with every play group I've played with. With every play group yes. I've played with, they've immediately realized, right. oh no, we have right. to hurry. Something terrible is happening. Right. right. I really feel like those real time things are, again, you know, challenging players. They're very concrete. They're, they're again, clearly not at the whim of the DM. So, I mean, I feel like the first time I ever saw that was actually in Tomb of Horrors. There's a couple of places where a trap goes off. And uh, the DM is supposed to count to 10 or something like count to five, right? Five, four, three. Two. And so I actually use that a number of times in my games and having the wandering monsters on a regular schedule mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and having the, uh, the, the ongoing trap in Death Frost Room on a regular schedule, I agree, is, I, I think really makes it concrete and visceral and I think is a good, uh, really it seems to work better than uh, checking off uh, 10 minute increments on a piece of graph paper. Yeah, uh, I like. Slowly, I like. It me down, it's not visible to the players, and I prefer. I prefer to have it be kind of more concrete. Yeah, I, I think that sounds really nice. As a, um, again, if you can solve the Goldilocks problem some other way, which it sounds like you have between the healing rules and between just saying nope, yeah. you can't you can't memorize spells anywhere but your nice, comfy study at home. Um, then I think that's I think that's great. Um, yeah. You know, but I mean, I'll point back to uh, almost a year ago when we did our. Um, my birthday game, right? Eventually, right. you guys delved down to a point where you found the the rat prince's lair, and you made friends with him, and he let you sleep there. So I feel like, right, right. Every every rule must have a, uh, uh, you know, uh, a case that breaks it. What is it? That, that's the. Uh, um, oh, there's a there's a phrase for that. Okay, brain's not working anymore. Well, there's the uh, there's the there's the Bronstinian uh, anything can happen principle, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. we should mm -hmm. anything should be on the table. To possibly break rules, um, and then there's the um, the Joel Spalsky all abstractions are leaky principle, which kind of dancing around. Not exactly the same thing, but yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, let me... uh, that, and that was a great piece of business. That's a great piece of business. You know what? You know, yeah. I, I I was actually, you know, I wouldn't have designed it, and yeah, I was so happy to have this uh, this ridiculous opportunity for negotiation, and then there was like a duel, and then there was like gambling with the rat prints uh it deep in the dungeon um and then have a you know and then have a have actually a semi you know secure base for yeah. further expeditions was so great it was such a great piece of business you know back uh, uh over memorial day i hosted a panel uh on uh, part of con of champions uh, apologies right. here the uh lawnmower guy is going right by my window right now so i'm sure you'll hear that sorry everyone um, <laughs> Uh, I hosted a panel on creating custom monsters, and just as an icebreaker, I asked everybody to introduce themselves and and tell me what their favorite classic D and D monster was. Brilliant. Um, and you know, I I had already introduced myself as the as the moderator, and I forgot to answer it myself. And um, my favorite monster, if I had to go to one specific thing, is probably a lich. But any monster specifically who is smart enough to talk to the players and crazy enough to want to do so. <laughs> right. That's that's what I love about a lich, right? A lich is, you know, can have a conversation with the players, and yeah. you know, and and is unhinged, yeah. so right. is willing. Like that, who knows what direction? I've right. had so many good encounters right. with liches where I remember I had one where basically I had one player in the party um, save the whole rest of the party by saying, I will stay here with you and help you solve this impossible to solve, you know, our ar arcane problem. I will right. become your student and don't worry about these right. people. They're just going to leave. Right. <laughs> and, and I was like, and that's how that adventure ended with this guy 
right. you know, sacrificing himself to <laughs> uh, to lichdom. I was like, oh, it's so Brilliant. good. Oh, Brilliant. so good. Brilliant. Sorry, that was such a tangent. How did I get talking about talking to monsters? I love monsters who talk. That's my point. I want monsters who <laughs> the players can talk to. And even if it <laughs> even if it breaks the you can't sleep in the dungeon principle, which is the, yeah, which is the standard rule, right, 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 yeah. right. Where is yeah. the, where we get to the to the rat yeah. prince, the rat prince. They are crazy and amazing. When that happens, I, you know, when it happens for me, it tends to be like semi accidental when that pops up, and I'm like, oh, well, this is a wonderful little refreshing surprise. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah I, it's uh, you know, I definitely when we were running that, I did not, and like I knew, I was hoping that you would get to talk to the rat prince. I had no idea how it was going to end. Uh, right. The fact that it went to some weird duel was fantastic, and then the, and then I was like, oh, it's reasonable that the party, I guess, would befriend him, and yeah. you know, and then of course set us up for the lovely ending with the Red Prince, which I will not spoil. You know, it's, ni <laughs> it's nice to have uh, you know, it's nice to have factions in a big dungeon, yeah. and then there's you know, play about you know, can we play one against the other, and can we you know, ally ourselves with one and. Or you know, be a double agent or something like that. Those are and and having a dungeon that's big enough to have multiple competing parties in it is actually opens up a whole lot of extra possibilities. I agree. I don't think large. you need a dungeon to do that, right? I think you, again, with your many small dungeons in a wilderness, you can still have factions. They just become yeah. uh, locations on the the hex map instead of locations in the dungeon. Yeah, yeah. I think in a dungeon, I mean, they're they're at least close to being right on top of each other. So there's like additional immediate friction, yeah, right? That's immediate, true. That's like, true. like we're we're running into each other automatically on a daily basis and contending or something like that. Um, so there's kind of this like piling on top of each other. There's immediate extra tension as a result. Yeah, yeah. So I do kind of like that. So let me let me bring us back to our discussion about wandering monsters. Uh, so we talked a lot about them in the dungeon. So what about the wilderness? We both agree we like to use them in the wilderness. How often are you rolling for wandering for wandering monsters in the wilderness? You know, I, you know, it's funny because uh, you. I think that you expect Paul that I have a pat answer to this because I've run. You know, out, I've done. I've done the outdoor survival or what I call outdoor spoliation with D and D games a number of times, and I over time I've become more and more murky about what <laughs> I should be doing. That's funny. And. Um, you know, so obviously, I think in original D and D, the main mechanic, the primary mechanic, is wandering monsters in the wilderness. Yeah. When they say go to outdoor survival, they actually don't say make layers. It's just like here, there's some castles run by people, and other than that, go to the wandering monster table. There's wandering monsters, and then of course there's a there's a core statistic for original D and D monsters. It's the percent in layer. And so you're going around the wilderness, you run into wandering monsters, and then you roll, when one pops up, you roll percentile dice to find out whether this was actually in a lair or not. Right. And that's the only way, that's the only core way that monsters appear in the wilderness in original D&D, and that sort of became vestigial over time. And so the problem is, like, I think along about last October or so, I got access to Dave Arneson's first fantasy campaign product, and in that, he really kind of takes that mechanic to task. He actually says, uh, you know, boy, that could, you know, wandering monsters can show up in large numbers and really ruin your day. And he attempts to present a totally different mechanic in which he, I think, pre-rolls in every single hex on the map for what monster is there to the tune of, like, maybe four to six monsters per 10 mile hex in your entire campaign map. And then you're committed to on a seasonal basis, <clears throat> making rolls in every sing for every single monster in every single hex, how many people get born and how many people die and whether they migrate one hex over. And then the DM has to roll a fight with the next layer over. And then as players move, <laughs> and then as players move around the board, you have to roll for whether the wandering monster is coming from this hex or one adjacent. And then, and I'm like, I, how, I mean, this has to be aspirational. There is no way on earth that anybody ever took the time to do this for every hex and have a complete master list. And I've seen people online claim that, oh, Arneson was just smart enough. He just would memorize all that stuff. And I'm like, I'm really super skeptical about it. So honestly, I've been struggling it for a couple like, months. 
Sounds like so okay. much homework. Oh, so much homework. Yeah. Mm, no thanks. And no I've thanks. tried to find a halfway point. So the half and and so okay. So for me, using the like even using the original D and D rule, like here's my problem. Right. You want you're 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 moving around the wilderness. I, I roll for wandering monster. I roll for the in lair check. Well, now I have to document that. Right. Now I have an on now I have an ongoing list mm -hmm. in every single hex. Of all these layers that I got to track, and I got now I got to look that up. Has a layer been previously rolled up in this hex? Because now I guess I have to handle that. And is there only one layer per hex, or can there be more? And um, so it kind of becomes an ongoing um, documentation problem. If I once upon a time I was really high on that, it's like oh you're developing the wilderness layers on the fly as you play. But I did that a little bit. I'm like, oh crap! Now I have an ongoing documentation problem. If I'm recording more and yeah, more and more yeah. stuff, and I have to remember or keep a list about every single hex the players travel through multiple times, whether there's a layer there or not. And so, actually, right at the moment, you know, so for a couple months, I've actually kind of been in a real uh, 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 mystery zone about what what is the best mechanic. Hey. I just want to point out, uh, it delights me to no end that you are uh, breaking the the hearts. Oh, no. Why did that appear giant on our screen? That's not what was supposed to happen. <laughs> wow, I am I am, a, I am attacked. Look at... Geez, what, I, what is going I'm, on? <laughs> Something what is... is I gotta, I mean, how do I get rid of it now? I hope, that, I hope, uh, I hope I'm not... <laughs> oh, my God. Sorry, everyone. That was supposed to show up in the little pop-up. Uh... <laughs> Oh, and God. it's twice. It's proliferating. Has that been there the whole time? Because there's a second one down here. No, oh man, I, I don't someone know. really wanted to burn me on that. Oh. Well done. There. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Well wait, done. Wait. I can. I. Oh my. Now God. while Paul's while Paul's. <laughs> I was just to... amused that somebody was as horrified as I am that you don't follow exactly the precise rules. But I'm pointing out that this person on top of this is pointing to the Wilderness Survival Guide. That's the that's an AD and D supplement there. And and I don't know if I don't know if you've seen that, but I tried to use the Wilderness Survival Guide in my college game and it alone destroyed my game. Okay, okay. Um Wow, it is just really weirdly <laughs> Should we, should we? Yeah, oh, you got it. No, weird. no, no. I can't seem to make it go right. Um, bear with me, everyone. Bear with me. Uh, this. Oh, it's changed your. I see what's happened. It's changed yeah, your yeah. title. It's changed your title yeah, from yeah. Dan Collins to. <laughs> wow. That's a nice hack. Whoever managed to accomplish that, I'm super impressed. Woo, okay, I found it. I found it. Right? Wow. I see. I see. We should put in quote like a middle. I don't know if a summer okay if Dan doesn't follow the WSP uh, columns. <laughs> uh, okay, so I know exactly what Golly. happened. So that's funny. Uh, okay. Uh, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Um, so, specifically on the Wilderness Survival Guide, on the AD&D Wilderness Survival Guide, I tried... You know, the funny thing is because that's by Doug Niles, right? Isn't the WSG by Doug Niles? And the... Um, uh, oh, you're asking me as if I might know that. There's no way I know that. Uh, let me just look at it up. And the funny thing, you know, Doug Niles runs hot and cold for me. Uh, I'm going to see it in just a second here. Um, no, it's Kim Mohan, right? Okay, that makes more sense. So Doug Niles wrote the um, the uh, the Dungeoneer Survival Guide, which is actually fairly solid to me. And then Kim Mohan wrote the Wilderness Survival Guide, and I tried to use that religiously in my college game. And like an idiot, I allowed it to destroy my game because the it's got weather rules that are so enormously complicated that I just like my whole game was actually just trying to handle that, and it was awful, and I felt terrible about it. I I understand the desire for weather rules. I like, honestly, yeah. having them, like you were mentioning earlier, boiled down into your random encounter. Random encounter doesn't have to mean monster for me, right? I like yeah. I like a random encounter table that's got, you know, yeah. weather events, it's got monsters, yeah. it's got friendly yeah. NPCs in it, right? Like, all yeah. kinds yeah. of stuff. Um, yeah. I actually really, so for my wilderness games, when I'm running a campaign, and like I said, I like to run it generally in the big wilderness with many 
dungeon scattered about. That means my players are often trekking from one place to another across a wilderness map. And right. I do expect them to draw their own wilderness maps. I don't give it to them. So yeah. uh, either get out the hex paper and draw along with me or draw just a representational yeah. map. Yeah. Um, and, and it's fun because I think that that means sometimes they find, oh, here's an alternate way to get from point A to point B and they start coming up with different routes to take. Right. Um, I use good old uh, Rich Burlew's uh, tongue-in-cheek method of I roll uh, once per day. Once per day. Yeah. I don't care how fast you're moving or how much land you're, you're traveling across. Once per day I roll yeah. a wandering monster or wandering a counter check. And this is a case where I actually really love the tables right back in the back of volume three. Just give me a, a yeah. chance for wandering monster to appear based on terrain type. And then a nice yeah. table of like really just, you know, not too many, but a very wide range of yes. things that might be in that, yes. in that terrain type. Yes. Um, I think it's really nice too, like, because there's some stuff like if you're on a road, the chances are very high that you meet, you know, humans. Yep. And then yep. I love that. I'm like, great. It's just someone else on the road, right? It's doesn't have, it, this can be a, a random, you know, you're meeting up with NPCs or other travelers, and maybe that's beneficial, right. or maybe it's bad. Who knows? Maybe there are thieves out right. to get you. We'll find out through play. Right. Let's go. I'll tell you, I'll tell you a thing. So, you know, like original D&D &D doesn't have, again, original D&D &D is set up for the outdoor survival map of like an expanse of just wilderness, and there's actually no roads um, and just horrible monsters everywhere. And so one thing that I've done to tweak in my campaign is, A, I actually do, uh, I actually did give the players a campaign map, you know, kind of in the sense of outdoor survival so that they can make decisions about how to get from A to B. You want to go directly over the mountains or you're gonna, you want to go through the woods around the mountains instead? And they're yep. debating, you know, they have awareness and knowledge about what kind of choice they're making there. Um, and original D&D doesn't have road encounters so what i do is i was actually adding an additional die of you'd have the normal monster encounter die and specifically if you're on a road the lost the, the lost die goes away but it gets replaced by a roll for somebody else on the road Interesting. and as a result what's happened a couple times is i've gotten both i've gotten both the monster die coming up yes and the other traveler die coming up yes simultaneously and so i've had the players run into a, like a bunch of merchants being attacked by monsters. Nice. No, oh, that's great. That's and great. they've had to make a decision about, do we just bypass this and let it go? Do yeah. we get involved? Which right. side do we get involved in, right? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. a couple of times they've, they, and then it turned into like a, a giant mass battle actually of, um, you know, a hundred, a hundred merchant guards and 120 orcs and the players made, you know, attack the leaders and made the difference. And then the merchants gave my players a reward based on random dice, which was the biggest reward they've ever gotten. And they were like, well, we should just wander around the road <laughs> saving merchants because this is, this is by far the most profitable thing that's ever happened to us in Dan's oh, games. So oh, I guess we could just be wandering vigilantes on the road now. Um, and I was like, oops. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, didn't, I, had, I hadn't thought the, I hadn't thought through the, this could happen simultaneously. And I hadn't yeah. thought through what, what I'm, how am I going to handle it? And I hadn't thought through like, what are the merchants going to react at the end? And then, and then I accidentally kind of gave away too much stuff. But, uh, but uh, that was a, that was an interesting piece of business the way I did that. That's funny. Yeah. That's great. That's great. One point I want to touch back on. So you said you want, uh, a set of wandering monster tables that are reasonable in size, right? Not not too large. Yeah. And I feel like in the, with the tables in original D and D, which again I didn't start playing until you know much later in life, about twelve years ago now or something like that. Um, they're the right size, right? The both the dungeon tables and the wilderness tables are like maybe eight things, maybe six, eight, ten things per table. And it's in the, it's in, for me, it's in the right ballpark of the seven plus or minus two psychology, short-term memory type of thing. I can feel the flavor of it. it. seems reasonable. And again, it's, you know, it's, it's tuned to the Greyhawk castle environment, or it's tuned to the, you know, Greyhawk outdoor survival map. And I feel like uh, Gary made a mistake later on is when he switched to AD&D and the monster list starts expanding and there's more supplements and there's more monsters, right? He tried, in with AD&D, he tried to pile every single monster in the game into these dungeon tables. And here's, here's I think, here's my take on that. I, I, yeah. I don't, I like a large variety of monsters. I like yeah. there to be tons of different crazy monsters yeah. in the world. 
But I think once you go that road, it behooves you to start whittling down tables based on context, right? I want to know, well, this area of the world is got a lot of, you know, fey in it. So I'm going to have fairies and sprites and trolls and blah, blah, blah. And I'm going to have a custom wandering monster chart for here versus over there right. where it's uh, right. mountainous and, you know, I want rocks and griffins and stuff like that. Totally agree. Totally and I think, yeah. I think when you're making that kind of table, I think uh, you should be looking at the, the actual physical dice you're going to roll. And right. you probably don't want anything bigger than a d20. The moment you've gone to percentile, yeah. your table's too big. Oh, uh, yeah, totally agreed. Totally agreed. Even d20, even, like for me, even d20 is like, maybe uh, a little too big. Yeah. Yeah. If, it, if it's one through six, if it's two through 12, that I actually don't, I don't think I want to get past two through 12. I'm I, suddenly I'm irritated. Like I want the players to recognize it, right? I want them to go into a place and come away and go, geez, that place is really bad. There's a bunch of fire resistant trolls or whatever, right? And then when they go in the, you know, so they're warning people about it. That's the thing on their mind. When they go in the next time, there's at least a, there's at least a semi good chance that they're going to run into the fire resistant trolls and say, well, we because we, we were we knew about this and we were prepared and we brought a bunch of cold attacks or something like that. Mm -hmm. So it, it pays off we could because of our knowledge. And if it's so large that they never uh, encounter the same thing twice, then it doesn't feel like a like a good payoff to me. Yep. Yeah, um, I agree. I agree. I agree. And so I feel like um, the uh, I think like with the monster like the AD and D monster manual too. Uh, Gary started to go in that direction of like here's a list here's big lists of monsters by terrain we recommend and weirdly he's got this mechanic of roll a what d8 plus d12 like make tables with with d8 plus 12 d8 plus d12 and then you know rare monsters on the ends and common monsters in the middle you know that reminds me a lot of when we were playing the 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 b solo adventure which had one yeah. Wandering monster chart numbered one through twenty, but then it had all these different rules based on what kind of dice with what kind of bonus you roll, uh, do right. which level you're on. Right on this level, roll one d six. On this level, roll one d eight plus four. Right, and it was just shifting where on the table you were, and I was like, Pretty couldn't you have just printed multiple tables though? <laughs> really? <laughs> well, it prevent having to repeat stuff, right? If he wanted, if they wanted, you know, stuff repeat, you know, repeated on the multiple levels, it, it is a clever way of avoiding repetitions, I suppose. Mm. Uh, I found it annoying to have to keep going. Really? Like, what is the okay. path? Okay, D okay. this one's D twelve. Right. What? Okay. All right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I get it. But. I can see both. I can see both. <laughs> and, and looking at the table, it's not immediately obvious like what stuff shows up on what levels. Right. Right. It's a little harder to read. Yeah. Right. Right, that makes sense. That makes sense. So on, yeah. So I wish that uh, I wish that that had been foreseen in the original books, because because neither you know neither O D and D or B X or A D and D explicitly say you know you need to tune the wandering monster charts f specific to the context of your dungeons. Kind of obvious, but there isn't a mechanic there to help you yeah. decide on frequencies or commonality or anything like that. There's just a giant table with, and obviously, if in AD and D you're rolling percentile dice, and there's a giant table with monsters of anything in the game can show up on any particular level, that actually becomes that. That's the place where when people complain about wandering monsters not making sense, I agree. It's like just anything in the entire universe could be wandering <laughs> through the particular fifty foot stretch of corridor on a particular daily basis. I agree. Yeah. That's 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 you. That's hard to explain. Well, and the, you know, with with a large variety of monsters, you um, if you do bother to make your own tables, it does let you thematically push ideas in your campaign world. Like I remember yes. when I was running my yeah. long running campaign, I had uh, an area called the Gloom Wood, which was specifically a kind of spooky woods that was always dark and there was you know supposed to be haunted and etc. And so I wrote a special table for it that was all full of undead and lycanthropes and um, stuff that is spooky, right? And it just really helped, right? Anytime you went in there, you were like, yep, we're definitely going to be facing these kinds of things. I think that's nice. So I will nice. say that, yeah, to, I mean, that's totally what you want. I mean, that's absolutely what you want. And um, I will say that, you know, so for me, at least in my dungeons, the wandering monsters are five times out of six tied to some lair, right? Yeah. So at some point, if you find the right place, you're probably going to find the central stronghold headquarters of this group, and maybe they'll have a leader, and they'll have you know, a living situation and explain why they're, you know, moving around, stuff like that. In other places, like maybe maybe more wilderness stuff, 
right? The context of the environment is actually communicated via the wandering monster tables. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? The wandering monster tables are actually informing you and the players what this place is like, and what the you know what the uh, the, the demographics and the and the the, the uh, uh, ecosystem is what I'm looking for. The ecosystem is like, and so when we switch to running a convention game, Paul, and we wipe out the wandering monsters, occasionally that's a big loss because that whole environmental information uh, communication gets ripped out. And I'll say at the time that really hurt me was when I was running the um, uh, Descent into the Depths series, the D1, D2, mm -hmm. D3 original right. Drow series. Most of the interesting, like what's the underworld like is being delivered on the wandering monster tables. Mm. And there's all kinds of like, well, you know, dark elf merchants and, you know, gnomes and the mind flayers that can show up and interact with them and, you know, weird extra dimensional demons and ghoul, you know, big groups of ghouls and, you know, Zorn types of creatures that don't appear in any of the set locations uh, of those modules. And so for me, it was actually a real challenge. Like I was wrestling, like, do I strip out the wandering monsters for the convention game? Because that's actually where all the interesting, you know, what's the crazy underworld like gets communicated. But you don't have time for all that. You don't have time. That's the problem, right? Is you, you, if you're running it as a convention game, you've got four hours. Yeah. You have to carefully, yeah. you know, uh, yeah. collate what's going to be, be in the... Yeah. yeah. That's, yeah. I mean, I totally agree with you. If you're if you're running it just for your home group and you've got arbitrary number of sessions in which to do it, great. Roll roll on them tables, man. Go for it. It's I kind of the right choice. It was hard for me to digest. It was hard yeah. for me to digest. I said, look, the convention, it's a different thing. Yeah. It's you're gonna you're gonna hit the high points, you're gonna hit the tent poles, this is what you're delivering, these set encounters, that's that you know, it's a different game and I just I had to digest it and it was it was hard for me to get over that that hurdle, but you're totally right. You know, and the interesting thing I'll point out is it seems to me like, um, you know, we've, we've covered how, like, Wandering Monsters has always been a little vague, I guess. Like, early editions of the game, it was constantly being too... Tweet, 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 tweet. Speak, <laughs> speak, Paul. Speak your words. Uh, tuned, right? It was constantly changed in all the modules and whatnot. It was, it was, it was yeah. under constant revision. It never really felt very explicitly laid out. Here's how Wandering Monsters work. And then as later editions come along, it just vanishes entirely. And I'm having really yeah. a lot of trouble thinking of other games, not D&D, that have a Wandering yeah. Monster rule in them. And I almost feel like, here's, here's my crazy theory, that maybe it comes out of the fact that in the early days of the hobby, there just wasn't a lot of content. So you needed procedural systems to generate the content. And now there's so much content that we expect, you know, the, this sort of pre-written, pre-thought out content to take place of all that. And we don't need, in theory, don't need procedural generation anymore. That's a great thesis. That's a really, that's a really strong thesis. Um, that's... That's that's probably smart. I yeah. I mean, I you know, assuming you want to use other people's stuff, I will say that you know, as someone writing, trying to write my own campaign, and maybe unwisely trying to not use other people's stuff when I do that, that's a lot of space to fill, and um, uh, and, and and I don't want to write. You know, I don't want to spend time writing the adventures as verbosely as you get in published stuff. Yeah. Um, and having systems that can generate stuff for my campaign world on the fly, uh, assuming I don't want to use other people's stuff, assuming I don't have an infinite amount of time, then it was still an important mechanic for me to um, to populate my world. But uh, but if but it, but but you're that it's a really it's a really strong point that there's a there's an enormous amount of content out there and maybe you can get away without it. That's a strong piece of right. It's interesting. Yeah. I, I I feel like it, it's almost like just you're you're treating your audience differently, right? It's a question yeah. of are you presenting them with the the things they need to build their own adventures, or are right. you just presenting them with adventures, right? Are you are you teaching Great. a man to fish, or are you providing him with fish? Great. Great, great point. Super great point. I kind of, I, I know we're running out of time, but I feel like it's a little bit of a shame that we didn't talk about um, module B1. Right? B1 is, uh, isn't that the module which which is totally unstocked 
and is you're meant to like stock on the fly as as you go that tends to get that's a little bit of hyperbole you're, you're yeah. basically it's a little bit of hyperbole uh so obviously b1 might car you know the locations have stuff is the thing the locations have stuff and sometimes really super long detailed stuff places and equipment and things and puzzles and traps and doors and transporters and all kinds of stuff the one thing that they that's not placed there are where the monsters are uh where the monsters or <clears throat> with Spe specific treasures um and you're right the dm is supposed to go through and place it i think that um let me see b1 is like that the original b3 is like that hmm. merle rasmussen's first module to top secret is like that interesting so there was a there was a phase with these introductory adventures at one point where they thought that's what they were doing all the time as a i think as a you know a transition point from a completely pre-made module versus a completely, you know, DM from scratch module. So they, they were trying to give this middle ground, I think, of like training you how to make a dungeon. Right, right. But it's really only training you on that one detail of where to, how to put the monsters in, right? Like right. all this, all the hard stuff of how right. to have a theme and how to, you know, how to put those intentional encounters and how to write clever traps. Yeah. That's all missing. Like, we'll just let you do yes. the, the grunt work. Of roll on tables and put monsters in place. Well, it's not rolling. It's they're not they're not they're not made to be rolled on. You're supposed to select them oh, uh, really? intelligently. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. They're not the, the tables aren't of a length of any particular die. Uh, they're actually labeled with Roman numerals. Um, so no, you're not. That's not a that's not a rolly thing. You're supposed to pick and choose intelligently where you're putting stuff. Admittedly, I uh, own some copies of B1. I've yeah. never sat down and read it back cover to cover. I've I've played it enough times for me to go, I don't, I don't need this adventure. <laughs> okay. Okay. Some people love it. Some yeah, people love one due to the flavor. And and I've and I, I on my at some point I have a you know a post on my blog of like is B1 too detailed to be a good example for new DMs making it is it just have like too much, you know, flavory type stuff yeah, yeah. to to intimidate starting DMs. And I've had people really uh, n you know, really kick back against any kind of, you know, any kind of complaint against B1, because some people really, really love it. It has a lot of imaginative stuff. I mean, it has a lot of imaginative stuff in it, so I can, t I totally understand why. The pool yeah. room's great. <laughs> oh, sure, sure. Yeah, I'm sure there are, there are good details. Um, again, like, I, I guess I've just had enough opportunities to play through it as a player, um, yeah. where that, the aspect of it as a teaching guide or whatever, that part of it, I was right. like, I don't, I don't need that. And so your experience um, as a player has been what, 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 what made you not happy about it? Uh, well, for one, the ridiculous twisting impossible to map corridors with their diagonals and corkscrews right. and stuff like that yep. is super annoying. And then two, right. like, you know, the non-placed, I mean, we, we had uh, a friend who would run it like by actually rolling dice on random tables on the fly. Oh, and, oh well, that's not, and that's, that's not uh, how it's um, you know, and that, that made it very shaky, right? It's sort yeah. of, uh, you know, sometimes it was good and sometimes it was bad. And I was like, eh. I see. see. Anyway, I, I'm that's judging not, a thing based on, on having only yeah. played it and never actually sat down and read the whole thing. So it's uh, uh, really a poor, poor stance for me to be judging anything from. So it's a very up. old. I mean, it's, a, it's a very it's a very old school thing that the whole like tangled hard to map corridors. I mean, according to original you know original players yep. with Gygax, that was the game. The whole game was I like, understand hard to map dungeons with occasional monsters. So I mean, that comes through, and I'm not defending it, yep. but I, I see where that came from. And the other thing is, it's most you know it's mostly empty of monsters actually, right? So you, the when original D and D says the vast majority of your dungeons will have no monsters. B1 does that, and so it's actually the, the problem that I've had is that I've had a player play B1. Actually, it was disinvited Arsis as well. running, so I've had a player <laughs> play B1 right, that has a fairly small number of monsters, right? And then and then take those characters, switch to B2, where Gary has about five times as much monsters. I wasn't immediately cognizant of that fact, and just immediately get massacred in B2. Yeah. Right, with the same characters that were successful in B1. So that you have to be careful about how few monsters there are in B1 is the main thing that I'm aware of now. All right, I have drawn us off into a crazy tangent, especially one that I am ill-informed to speak on, and we're almost out of time. So, 
Yeah. One last thing. Speaking of final time, thoughts. Paul. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I guess before I go to the final thoughts. Yeah. So there was a brief time. Speaking of time and keeping track of time, there was a brief time between your uh, flippy turn marker and 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 I think what you do now, where you use an actual sand timer on the table. Yeah, yeah, I did try. Do you do that anymore, or is that not that? No, I did not. And the problem with it is is simply this: I was trying to time the entire duration of the. Yeah, you know, I wanted a four-hour timer. Couldn't find right. a sand glass that was a full four hours, so I had one that was just like one hour. And then I tried to get clever with it about like what happens at the at the end of hours. Right. And right, the problem right. is it was yet one more thing for me to manage as DM, and I would forget about it. And then I'd look and go, oh, it's empty. How long has it been right. sitting there empty for? <laughs> right, right. And then there was a time where you tried to pass it over to the players. You, you passed it over to the player's side and said, you watch this and tell me when it's over. Yep, yep. Um, Which is nice, but the players need some positive yeah. incentive to do that. They need a carrot, right. or they're not going <laughs> right. to be on top. The other, the other, I mean, I liked it being on the table. The first time I saw it, I was like, great, great. And then the other problem you'd run into is, like, if you need to jump forward in time, right? You'd go, oh, we're going to jump forward three hours. We need to reset the sand timer. And then we're, like, shaky, 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 <laughs> trying, to, trying to forcibly reshake it, you know, with the halfway through. With the, um, so it, we got locked in and not being able to jump, jump time when you wanted to. I feel like I was using mm -hmm. it when I was trying to – the one time I remember using it was when I was running sort of, like, let me teach brand new players who've never played how to play D&D. And I was right. trying to reinforce that we literally only had four hours. I remember playing with this one younger player uh, who was okay. just flabbergasted when, it, when I, I flipped the thing. And, and, and I said, okay, I'm going to do this you know, three more times or two more times or whatever it was. And, 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 and he said, well, well that, what happens then? What happens when that runs out? And I said, the game's over. And he was just like, oh. so I couldn't, I couldn't believe that we would just end. the game would just end. <laughs> like, well, it's got to end. I, I can't stay here forever, my man. <laughs> I had a I had a I had a student once who got we got to the final exam which is coming up in another week actually so years ago uh, we got to the final exam and they were like and then they asked them um, and what do we do after the after the final and I said <laughs> go home well, live your life nothing. yeah it's it's, <laughs> it's it's final at that point it's, it's the class is final and we're done and they said oh well, that's I'm very sad about that because I've really been enjoying these meetings that we've been having. <laughs> And, and, so I don't know, you know, I don't know what situation had come in before. They were unaware of what, you know, what happened at the end of a semester. But um, that reminds me of, uh, it reminds me of your player not cognizant that things end. It ends, man. It ends. We got <laughs> Unfortunately. Sorry. <laughs> Unfortunately. All right. All right. So, Dan, final thoughts on Wandering Monsters. I mean, I think, I mean, for, for the old school games that, that we play and I play, I mean, they're really a fundamental core part. They've been there since outdoor survival. Um, uh, you know, that's where it comes from. They're, you know, it's, they're, they're, they're sort of the, the main balancing technique over your spells per day, kind of, you know, what people call 20 minute venturing day problem. Um, uh, they, they give you a lot of context, right? They give you a lot of context to what the environment you're in is like. It's a very concise way of communicating that. Um, I, you do want them to be connected and hooked into your layers and what the environment is. You don't want it literally just be random anything. And I do think that that was a little bit of an oversight in the original rules not to explicate your wandering monsters are things in your location, tie them into that. Mm -hmm. And I think that failing to explicate that is maybe where they get a little bit of a bad rap. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for me, they're, they're a great tool to have in the toolbox. I think you need to know how to use them intelligently, which means you have to question why, why are they here? What purpose are they serving? Yeah. Make sure you know the answers for that in your game, and then, uh, then you'll know how to use them effectively. And when to just decide to pass. I, I think the list, I mean, the list should be curated. And for me, I like to be surprised. So I will have I will have a pretty hardcore mechanic that I'm rolling on because I don't trust myself to adjudicate what, what a crazy chaotic world is like. But the list should be curated very intelligently and you should be aware about why you want, why, why these things are in this location. Yeah, 100% agree with that. Yeah, all right. Definitely. Kind viewers, it's time for us to wrap up. If you have any thoughts on when to roll for Wandering Monsters, how to roll for Wandering Monsters, whether you should roll for Wandering Monsters, uh, please leave us some comments here in the video chat. We would love to hear from you. Uh, we will uh, respond, and we will possibly spin out whole new shows based on your thoughts. So uh, please tell us what you think. Definitely.
definitely. And how many DMs show up when you when they when they show up on their wandering monster check? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, remember, uh, so remember, viewers, that you can uh, like and follow and subscribe to us on YouTube and Twitter and Twitch and also Facebook by the handle Wandering DMs on all those sites. You can also find audio-only podcast versions of our show. Uh, these are available on our website at wanderingdms.com, uh, or you can download them from the variety of podcast carriers, such as iTunes and Google Podcast. Uh, if you are uh, listening to us on one of those carriers, please take a moment to rate and review us. We really appreciate that. We definitely do. And thanks again to our patrons who support the Wandering DMs show. Uh, if you would like to join them, and we hope that you will, uh, if you have some, uh, some extra resources at the, t at the moment, uh, please visit patreon.com slash wandering DMs. Uh, next week, Paul, uh, we're going to have a guest uh, lined up, scheduled, uh, Mr. Landon Schertz, who is a professor of philosophy um, and works in the areas of aesthetics and philosophy of games and pop culture. Um, and he's written uh, some notable papers on uh, superheroes and uh, the ethics of Batman and uh, philosophy of games and things like that hmm. that he's shown at conferences. And so personally, I'm really looking forward to speaking with Landon Schertz uh, next week on the philosophy of games and role-playing games like D&D. So please join us. Uh, please join, uh, we hope that our viewers will join us for that. Uh, look for other shows throughout the week. We'll let you look at the, uh, the normal schedule um, that's, uh, that's coming up this week. Uh, please do connect to us on social media sites, and then you'll know about what other shows we have. Remember, of course, we are live every Sunday at 1 p.m. Eastern time for our flagship talk show right here. So please join us next week for another thought-provoking discussion. We'll see you then.